And it might have just been for Brother Bones this morning and for Brother Bruce this morning, but I tell you what, he showed up for them when they needed him. Amen. They, they called on the name of the Lord. And the Bible said when you call on the name of the Lord, that he will show up. Amen. He will show out. I know you hear me say that all the time. And I don't just say that just to be saying it. But I say it because it's true. That when you call on the name of the Lord, he said, I'll show up and I'll show out. I'll do so many great and wonderful things that you have never even experienced them before. And I tell you, I believe that's what we're seeing this morning. God is doing something that we don't even understand. You see that while we can't see here in the physical, God is doing something in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual world that we can't see with fleshly eyes. But God is healing, God is delivering, God is restoring. Amen. I tell you just like the story of Elisha. The Bible said that Elisha looked at the servant and said, God, open up his eyes that he can see what I'm seeing. And God opened up the servant's eyes. And when he looked around, he seen warriors, angels, all around the city. They was on every corner. And he said, there's more with us than they are with them. I'm going to tell y'all something this morning, church, and I hope you get a hold of it. There's a whole host of demonic forces outside that is wanting to kill you, that is wanting to destroy you, that wants to take you down in your faith and cause you to lose hope in God and cause you to lose faith in God and cause you to lose sight in God. But the Bible said that if you open up your eyes, you will see that there is more with us than they are with them. God's got a lot more angels. Hallelujah. He said, I've reserved unto me. Hallelujah. 7,000 that's not bowed and need a bell. Glory to God. I'm telling you, God's got more with you than he does with them. That's why the Bible said, greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. You see, the devil, he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this world. That's why we see so much corruption, Brother Mike, Brother Steve. That's why we see in this. It's not an a educational problem. It's not a political problem. It's a spiritual problem. You see, it's something that's been going on from the beginning of time. The Bible said that there was war in heaven. Revelations chapter number 12. And the Bible said that God, hallelujah, He cast Satan out of heaven. Jesus said it in the gospel. He said, I was there and I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Have you ever seen lightning strike from the top to the bottom? We saw it while we were down at the beach this past week. At how out in the ocean the lightning would strike from heaven and it looked like it would come down and touch that water. I'm telling you, Jesus referred to Satan's fall as seeing as like lightning from heaven. He said, I was there and I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He was cast down into this earth. Church, and in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and darkness and void and and darkness hovered over the face of the deep. Amen. You see, when Satan fell from heaven, he was in this earth. He was the darkness. He was the void that filled this place, this earth that we live in. But then God said, I'm not going to leave it like that. But I'm going to make man in our image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Hallelujah. And that's when men and women become. Hallelujah. You were born. Hallelujah. For such a time as this. Into this world. To be uh, fit for the kingdom of God to be fit for the master's use. Hallelujah. God said, I'm going to make male and I'm going to make female. And I'm not going to make no half-breed. I'm not going to make somebody some mistake. But I know who I'm going to create. I'm going to create the man to be leader of his house, to lead them to me. Hallelujah. I'm going to create woman to be the birth giver. I'm going to create woman to be the helpmate. You see, woman ain't left out. God created you for a purpose. Amen. It was for a helpmate, for to be a helper to your husband. And I'm going to tell you it's sad, but in today's world, a lot of the women are more the leader of the house than the male is. Y'all getting quiet on me. Amen. A lot of the women are more of the help or more of the leader of the house than the man is. And it's a, it's a shame that when I was growing up as a young child and going to church, I would see that it was the woman that was in church and not the man. You, you know, 
I'm just telling the honest here tonight, this morning. It was the women who would come to church. It was my grandmother who took me to church. And it was my uh, my grandmother who, every time the doors was open, she was on the phone or she was at my house. And you ready to go to church, hon? Yes, ma'am, I am. I'm ready to go get in the presence of the Lord. And I want to tell you something. That woman was a praying woman. And because of her prayers, now her grandson's in church. Her son's in church. Uh, hallelujah. Her one son's already there with her in heaven. Glory to God, I'm here to tell you, God created male and female for a reason. Amen. And it wasn't no mistake. It was to lead their family to church. Lead their family to Jesus. Amen. And God created them in the garden. Hallelujah. And He brought light to a dark world. Oh, this is amazing how God puts these thoughts together and it just goes right along with the word He already gave me this morning. God put light in a dark world. You see, Genesis 1 says that there was darkness and void in the earth. Satan was all over this earth. It was dark. There was no formations. There was nothing. It was empty. And you try living your life for the devil, and you'll find out your life will be just that. It will be dark. It will be void. It will be empty. It will be futile. It will be vanity. Because there's no purpose in serving the enemy. There's no purpose in living for the devil. But I want to tell you, children of God, there is a purpose for living for God. Amen. There is a reason why we come to church. There is a reason why we sing worship and praise. And there is a reason why the preacher gets up here and spits and hollers and sweats and runs around like a chicken with his head cut off. It's because we are in warfare with that enemy that wants to, to put darkness back in this land. He wants to put void and emptiness back in this land. But God said, I've always got a people. Hallelujah. I've always got a remnant that's going to stand. Hallelujah. Even when the world's on fire, we're going to stand against the enemy. Stand against the enemy's attacks. We're going to fight the good fight of faith. Like Paul said, I, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Church, that's what we got to do this morning. We got to keep the faith and keep fighting the good fight of faith. Because the enemy... He's spreading darkness all around. We talk about it all the time. When you turn on your news, all you see is shootings going on. Every time I would look at my phone, it seemed like it would say there's a shooting at the Walmart in Mississippi. Just right over the road. You know, used to, it used to be way away from here. It was out in Las Vegas. Or it was way down in Miami, Florida. Or it was up in New York City, Brother Roger. But now it's happening in little rural towns. How do you say that word? Rural. Royal. Rural towns. Little country towns. Can I put it that way? It's a lot easier for me to say. Little country towns. It's happening in places where there's churches on every corner. You see, because the enemy of the, 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 the ruler of darkness, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the earth, Satan himself, that's who I'm talking about. If you don't already know, he is coming into places that he used to wouldn't come. Amen. He's going into cities where there is churches on every block. And you want to know why? Because he's, he's made invited into those churches now. Where he used to, men and women of God would stand up and would say, uh, we are not going and tolerating anything by the devil. We are not going to invite any evil in, any darkness in. Uh, we are not going to become complacent to the things of this world, but we're going to be steadfast, uh, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, hallelujah. We're going to stand on the Word of God. Uh, we're going to tell sin is sin and what's right is right. Uh, but the Bible says there's coming a day when folks will say evil is good and good is evil. Bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Oh, and I want to tell you something, church. We're living in that day that the Bible said is leading up to the day of the Lord. We're living in a dark day. Me and my wife was reading last night, reading in Scripture where the Bible said, Woe to him that prays for the day of the Lord. For what is the day of the Lord to you? Is it not darkness, yea, and it is very great darkness? I want to tell you something, church. If you don't know the Lord, that day is going to be a day that is dark. 
It's going to be a day that's evil to you. It's going to be a day that you don't want to see. But for them that do know their God, the Bible said they will be strong and do exploits. Amen. For those that do know their God, we're longing for the coming of the Lord. We're longing for the trumpet to sound. We're longing to see God coming back with 10,000 upon 10,000 of His saints. We're longing to see the day of the Lord. You see, because we're living in the evil day. We're living in a dark day. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter number 60, I believe it is 59 or 60, but it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is upon you. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, church, this morning that we need to arise and shine. We need to catch on fire for God. Praise the Lord. We need to get that fire back in our bones that we once had. We need to remember our first love. Remember from whence we have fallen and go back and do our first works over again. Hallelujah. We need to call on Jesus this morning and say, Lord, light a fire in me that no man can put out. Do something in me, God. Make me the man. Make me the woman that you want me to be. And this morning as I was getting ready. God was giving me a word. I know Sister Sandra and Brother Roger were kind enough while we were going to get our mail and they come by the house this morning and brought our mail. I know Sister Sandra was probably thinking, well, the preacher's not going to make it to church this morning. It was right at 9.30. Here I was. I'm still in there reading and chopping things down. And I know she's probably thinking, oh, yeah. It's time to move on. But God was pouring something into me. I couldn't stop. I said, Lord, I'm going, I'm going. And I just kept having to jot these things down this morning. If you got your Bible, let me read this to you this morning. Leviticus. That's pretty easy to find. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter number 6. Praise the Lord. I'll give you just a moment to get turned there. Leviticus chapter number 6. I praise the Lord for what God is doing. I praise the Lord for bringing us back safely. Amen. And letting us get to come back and worship with our brothers and our sisters. Amen. To come lift up the name of the Lord. To get in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's no greater feeling. You know what? I wouldn't trade a million years at the beat for one day in the Lord's house. Amen. I'd rather be right here in the house of the Lord than to be on the beach for a million years. Amen. I'm telling you, there's something this beach couldn't do this to me. Amen. It couldn't give me the feeling that I feel right now in the Lord's house. Amen. That's why the psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness forever. Amen. I'm telling you, God is still good. God is still alive. Hallelujah. And the devil can't stop him. He knows he's defeated. Amen. Oh, children of God, we need to hear that. God is alive. He's not dead. He's alive. Amen. They tried to kill him, Brother Bruce, but they couldn't keep him dead. You see, the blood of Jesus got louder and louder and louder. <laughs> Woo, glory. I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus Christ, when they shed his blood on Calvary's cross, it ran down that post of that cross. It hit the ground, and it went all around. And they buried him and said, we want to shut that Nazarene down. We want to shut Jesus of Nazareth up. But when that ground, oh, when the blood began to soak in the ground, oh, God the Father looked down and he said, it's enough. There was millions upon millions of gallons of blood that was shed on burnt offerings and, and sacrifices before the Christ come, before Jesus come. And God the Father always said, it's not enough. But when the ground... When the ground first felt the first drop of Jesus and it hit that ground and his blood went in, God the Father looked down and said, it's enough. Do you remember when Cain killed Abel in the Bible? Cain, the Jesus, or God the Father looked down and he said, where is your brother Abel? He said, his blood is crying out from the ground. Listen, church. Jesus Christ's blood is still crying out from the ground. It is enough. By my stripes, you are healed. They tried to shut him up. They put a stone in front of the door. They put guards in front of the stones. And they tried to, to get a group of people to go and guard 
the tomb of Jesus. But they didn't, they didn't have enough. Sister Sandra, they wasn't enough. The Bible said that an angel come down and just will roll that stone away. And then he hopped up. I hope this table holds me up. He hopped up on that stone and sat there and looked out. The guards, Brother Bruce, fell over dead. And the Bible said that Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he got up. I'm going to read the Bible in a minute. But Jesus got up from being dead. He got up and he took those grave clothes off. Hallelujah. He folded them up. He put them nice and neat to his left, representing I'm not done yet. I'm still coming back for something more. Oh, and he walked out of the tomb. Glory to God, Jesus said. It is enough. On the cross, he hollered, it is finished. Hallelujah, my grace is sufficient. When you're weak, that's when I'm strong. And he's letting us know this morning, it's still enough. Brother Randall, the blood of Jesus is still enough. The devil wants to lie. It wants to steal. And he wants to tell everybody, oh, Jesus is dead. He stayed dead. That's just a lie. That's just a story. But I want to tell you something. That's what he wants you to believe. But if you'll just enter in. Oh, I feel that right now, my spirit, Sister Sandra. If you'll just enter into the presence of God, you will find and you will understand that that's not a fable. It's not a story tale. But our God is real. Hallelujah. I feel Him right now. I feel Him all over me. Praise God. I'm telling you, it's not a fable. It is the truth. Hallelujah. God come down in the form of man, in the form of His Son. And He laid down His life. And He redeemed all of us that would call on His name. And all of us who needed healing and salvation and deliverance, the Bible said it is finished. Meaning, what you're fighting right now is already done. There's no need to keep fighting what you're fighting. Jesus has already defeated it on the cross of Calvary. All you got to do is give it up to Him and say, Father, here it is. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. God's already told us. Let me get to the Word this morning. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Leviticus chapter 6. And we're going to read starting in verse number... Let's read verse number 8 down to verse number 13. Praise the Lord. If you found the place, would you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I tell you, it's so good to be back in the house of the Lord today. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying... This is the same Lord we just talked about, the only Lord. This is the capital L Lord. Uh, you see, there's a bunch of little L Lords and a little, bunch of little G gods, but there's only one true God, one true Lord, one true King, and that's the one that's speaking right here. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the God of prospect, hallelujah. It's the God of you and me this morning. He is God, and He always will be God. The Bible said that same Lord, that same God spoke to Moses saying, Command Aaron and his son saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. In other words, the fire shall never go out. You've got to keep the fire burning on the altar, it said. Verse number 10, Then the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh and take up the ashes which the fire has consumed with the burnt offering on the altar. And he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garment and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp, outside the camp, unto a clean place. Verse number 12 and 13, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. Keep the fire burning. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. they got to get the firewood and put on there every morning. And lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn there on the fat of the peace offerings. 
In verse number 13, the Bible said, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Would somebody say that with me? It shall never go out. Church, we got to let the fire go out. We got to keep the fire burning for Jesus in this earth. And we'll talk about that here in just a few moments. Would you pray first, though? Father, we thank you for what we feel in your house. We thank you, God, for worship. We thank you, God, for coming down and being with us this morning. God, we thank you for gathering us together. Lord, and I pray now that you would just help us, oh God. Help us to proclaim your word with boldness and clarity, with the anointing of the Holy Ghost and with fire. God, anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And God, may we draw closer to you before it's all said and done. God, we come against any hindering spirit that tries to uh, come against this morning, God. But we pray, God, let your spirit have its way in this house. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated if you like. Church, I'm sure you've all heard this before. There's probably been many people that said this, probably heard it. But boy, that church is on fire for God. Or either that person is really on fire for the Lord. Have you ever heard that? And church, we want to look this morning and consider some words of the Bible that will encourage us to keep the fire burning always. Listen, we can't just keep the fire burning when we're in the house of God. Hallelujah, that's too easy. God said, I want you to keep the fire going when you're outside in the streets. Uh, I want you to keep the fire burning when you're outside of my house. Uh, I want you to keep the fire burning when you're not around God's people. I want you to keep the fire burning, hallelujah, when you're in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, I want you to keep the fire burning at all times. And church, I gotta let you know this morning, we can keep the fire burning with God's help. It should be our prayer this morning that, that we're burning more now today. We're more on fire for God today than we've ever been before. And not just us, but this church. We need to pray this church burns brighter than ever before. And not this church only, but the other churches in our areas. And anybody who stands for the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to pray that they burn harder and they burn brighter than ever before. And let the devil see there is still a light in this dark world. Jesus said you are the light of the world. A city on a hill. A light that cannot be hidden. Don't let your light be trodden down by the foot of man. Don't let the devil put a bushel over your fire, over your candle. But you keep that candlestick burning. Hallelujah. We need to keep the fire going this morning. May this church be known and listen. I'm not making this up. You can ask several in here this morning. May this church be known that there's something going on here. May this church be known to have people walk in that back door and say, I don't know why I'm here. I, I, I was just going down the road and something tugged on my heart to turn in here and to come in and see what's going on. Listen, we've had it happen. We've had people come in and sit down and say, I don't know why I'm here. I was just passing by. And God said, turn in. So I did. And I'm here. I'm going to tell you another story. And my wife is my witness. And several others can vouch for this. We was up in prayer service one day. Kind of like I was praying earlier this morning. We was in prayer service one day. And God caused this man to wreck his car out there in the ditch of the church parking lot. There was a big ditch. And you said, I don't know about that, brother Chad. God ain't going to cost you. Listen, this man was dog-faced drunk. He was dog-faced drunk. We're all in there praying. Lord, send them in. Lord, send them in. And you know what he done? He caught that ditch outside to jump out in front of that man's car. <laughs> Come on, somebody. That car went right off in the ditch. He crawled out drunker than a skunk. He cut through those back doors of stumbling like this. <laughs> Oh, but when he come in, he didn't stop. Woo, glory. He didn't stop at the pew. He kept on going, Brother Randall. He didn't stop at this pew. 
pew or this pew and come right up to where we were. That's a dangerous place to be. Oh, when the anointing of God is being poured out, that's a dangerous place to be, especially when you're a sinner. But that sinner come forward. He got hands laid on him. Amen. He went down to his knees drunk. He stood up sober. Hallelujah. He proclaimed Jesus was Lord of his life. He prayed and asked God to save him. We went out there and got the woo. We went out there and got his car out of the ditch. Uh, he was there every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. He'd come in. When he come in the first time, he had on his shabby clothes. The next time he come, he had on a three-piece suit. He looked better than the preacher. Thank you, my goodness gracious. Look what the Lord has done. And may this church be known as people going by saying, I don't know why I'm here. I just know something drew me in here. Amen. I'll tell you, we need to pray that the uh, Holy Spirit would consume this place and draw folks in. Oh, there's so many stories I can tell about that. But this one story I heard, this pastor, he'd been preaching out of church for several years, a long time. And he got a phone call late one night, Sister Sandra, and and it woke him up it shocked him it startled him he was in amazement because when they called all they said was pastor the church is on fire yeah. get down here quick and so the pastor jumps up out of bed he throws his clothes on and, and he gets down to the church and he sees after this congregations out there they're praying they're hugging they're crying their church is totally engulfed in flames and it's almost a total loss and the fire department's trying to put it out but they're not having no luck with it they're not having no headway with it and so they're sitting there it trying to encourage one another. It's going to be all right. God's got this. God wouldn't take away what He's not going to give back. And, and so He's encouraging everybody. They're hugging, they're praying, they're talking, encouraging one another. And as the pastor hugs one person and prays with them, he notices in the distance there's a man that's standing over on the corner. And so the pastor, he said, I've seen that man before. And he goes and he walks to this man. And he said, I've never seen you in church before. I've never seen you in this church before. And the pastor said, I've, I've invited you a bunch, and, but I've never seen you come. And he said, that's because this church ain't never been on fire before. Now that's not the kind of fire that we're praying for this morning. That's not the kind of fire that we would ever pray that this church would have. But we do want to pray that the Holy Spirit would so consume us with His fire. Amen. That it would be, it would happen in a way that draws people inside. We want it to happen in such a way that people in this community will say, I don't know what's going on at that church, but there's some great things happening at that church. I'm talking about things that can't be explained. Things that only God can do. Hey, I want to tell you, Oh, hallelujah. Whenever God starts moving, word gets to spread. Think with me. Jesus told all them people that he healed. He said, don't go and tell nobody about that. What's the first thing they done? They were told to everybody. Jesus, don't go tell nobody. Whoa, Lord, I got to go. Look what Jesus done for me, y'all. That was his best preacher, the one he told not to do it. But the ones that he calls, what do they do? They run from him. I don't understand it. They run from him and hide. I'm going to tell you one thing this morning. You can't get away from God. I tried. Sister Sandra, I tried. And you can't get away from God. He'll track you down wherever you are. He'll throw a, a big fish out there to swallow you up. And take you to where you're going. I'm telling you, he'll put something in your way to where you're not getting to where you're going. He's going to get you back to where you're supposed to be at. Thank the Lord. This word. This word this morning. We need to pray. We need to ask this question. What is this fire? What is this fire that, that Leviticus is talking about? It said that verse number 9, Command Aaron and his son saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because the burning upon the altar all night until the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be burning upon it. Church, I'm going to tell you something. we got to keep the fire burning. We gotta keep the fire of the altar burning and never let it go out. You see, there's a lot of people today that's plagued with strange fire. If you turn the Bible, just a couple more chapters, you'll read that the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, that's some funky names, isn't it? 
Nay, Dab, and Abihu. Who would name their kids that? But they did. Aaron's wife, whoever it was, she said, we're going to name them Nate Dab and Abihu. I think it's mom. That's kind of worse than a boy named Sue, ain't it, Brother Bill? But this Bible said this was the sons that, that God had commanded them a certain way to do things. And just a couple more chapters over, you'll read that these two boys, they decided they didn't want to do church like God wanted them to do church. They didn't want to do and obey what God had said for them to do. They wanted to have their own thing. They think they know more than what God knows. You see, God's given us a command how to have church. He's given us a way how to live our lives. But a lot of times we think, we don't want to listen to what God said. We know better. We know how to have church to draw people in. But I'm going to tell you something. I heard an old preacher say this one time. And by old, I'm saying this was back in the 1950s. I like to listen to old preaching. This was back a long time ago. And this man, well, he might be dead now. I'm not sure. But he said these words. He said in most churches today, and this was in the 50s, and it's a lot worse today than it was then. And he said most churches today is having a hard time getting people to come in. Said that they have to offer chicken, ice cream, and tea. So that's the only way they can get them in their house. People don't want to hear the truth of God's word anymore. They want chicken, ice cream, and tea. And when they come in, they can sit down and have chicken, ice cream, and tea. But when they get up to leave, they're going to be just like that chicken, that ice cream, and that tea. He said they're going to be as dead as the chicken, as cold as the ice cream, and as weak as the tea. Listen, church. That's what Nadab and Abihu doing. They come in and they begin to play. The Bible said they played with strange fire. You see, God had already lit the fire on the altar. Once we become born again, once we become saved, God puts a fire on the inside of you that causes you to grow and grow and want more of Him and want more of Him. And God puts that in you. But sadly, most of the time, we don't keep it up like we're supposed to. You see, to keep the fire going, there's some work that has to be done. To keep the fire going, I know people don't like that word today. There's some work that has to be done, Brother Bruce. We can't just expect God to light the fire and keep it going on His own. God said, you've got some responsibilities to do. And sadly, when God puts that fire inside of us, when it begins, oh hallelujah, it's a burning inferno. It's a burning inferno. But sadly, we don't do anything to keep it up. And it becomes a little flickering light. Like a little candle when all the wax is almost gone and it's just barely, barely flickering. And that's where a lot of Christians are at today, Brother Rods. Their, their lights are barely flickering. Are they out? No, they're not out, but they're dangerously low. They're dangerously low. There's so much I've got to tell you this morning about this fire. What is this fire that Leviticus is talking about keeping it burning? I want to tell you exactly what it is. Over and over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, it gives us the symbol of fire. And the very first time that we read about fire in the Old Testament is when Moses was walking through the wilderness. He's walking church. He's just walking through the wilderness. A man of God. And he goes through and he looks over to his left and he sees this bush that is on fire. And of course that's nothing new to Moses. Moses sees a bunch of burning bushes. They people go through there and light these things on fire all the time. The song was scorching. They catch on fire. But except this bush was different than all the other bushes. How many know is that you, you cut some trees down and, and you strike a match and you put it up to that bush, them leaves are just going to evaporate. They're just going to be consumed. They're going to burn up in no time. But the Bible said that this bush that Moses saw, it was not being consumed. And so Moses was like, what in the world? Mm. Something's different here. Something's not right here, oh glory. I want to tell you something. When you have the fire of God, people's going to say there's something different here. Something's not right here. Glory to God. That's why they call us holy rollers. Oh, Bible thumper, pew jumper. Oh, glory. Call me what you will, honey. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm burning with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, glory. 
somebody right here, that fire is burning, but that bush ain't being consumed. And, and Moses is thinking, I don't know what in the world is going on, but I got to go check it out. How many knows when we see something, we, we, we get too nosy? Curiosity killed the cat, didn't it? Moses, I got to see what I got to get a little closer. And as Moses was getting closer to check out this bush, all of a sudden a voice come. The Bible said it was the voice of God. And said, Moses, don't come any closer. Take off your shoes, Moses, for the place where you're standing. The ground where you are standing is holy ground. I'm telling you, God spoke straight from heaven, straight through that bush. And he told Moses, take off your shoes, for the place where your feet are treading is holy ground. That's just the first time we saw the symbol of fire. The next time, after God spoke to Moses, the next place we see fire in the Bible is when God was leading, Moses was leading the children of Israel. And the Bible said that there was a, a, a cloud a, a, by day that would lead them, and then there was a pillar of fire by night that would lead them. Mm. And the next time we go on, later on in the Old Testament, we find that Mount Sinai, the Bible said that whole mountain was on fire. I'm talking about it was on fire. And the Bible said that the, the smoke was coming up off of the mountain as a great furnace. I picture it like a volcano. It was so hot and the fire was so strong that the smoke was going up to heaven and it filled the sky. And the Bible said that yet once more there was another voice that called for Moses to come up. Moses, come up here. Mm. And so Moses said, okay, Lord, I'm coming. He said, I want you to leave the rest of them there. No, I want you. I want you to come up. And so God called Moses up to the top of the mountain. We're there. He gave Moses the Ten Commandments on a tablet of stone. Y'all know how he wrote it? He didn't have a, that was the first tablet. That thing that Brother Mac and Sister Deb had a while ago. That tablet they had to sing. This was the first tablet. And God, instead of having what we call them opinions, they're right on Stylus? Yeah, thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm phone poor. I have no idea about them things. I'll show you my phone if you don't believe me. Amen. He didn't have a stylus. He used his finger. And God wrote out the Ten Commandments on that first tablet of stone. Amen. And, and listen, he gave it to Moses. That's the, the third time we see fire in the Bible. Then you read on later in the Bible, you go to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. And that's where a man named Elijah, and I know I'll tell you all this story all the time, but it's where a man named Elijah come up against 850 prophets. 400 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of the groves. And they had a deal. Anybody like Westerns? The old cowboys? We're going to have a deal. First one, draw. Yeah. I'd be dead first off, Brother Bill. I ain't got good reflexes. But Elijah the prophet said, we're going to have a deal. You can call on your God. We're going to put a bull out there. And whoever's God sends down fire from heaven and eats that bull up with fire, let him be God. He asked him a question before that. He said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If God be God, then serve Him. And if Baal be God, then serve Him. But how long, Brother Jim, are you going to straddle the fence? That's what Elijah would say to him. In church, a lot of times, we're in the same position. When we're at church, we have no problem serving God. But when we're out in the world, we have no problem living the world up. And Elijah the prophet, he gave the, the voice a long time ago. He said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If God be God, then serve him. But if Baal be God, then serve him. But quit straddling the fence. And I hear the voice of the Lord say today, that's where we got to do. We got to make up our minds and go all in. Either we're going to serve God or we're going to live for the world. But there's no straddling the fence. Jesus said in the book of Revelations, I will spew you out of my mouth. Somebody that comes to God's house on Sundays, you say, I'm a good person. I don't do nothing wrong. I don't live for the Lord. I, I go to church. But then all through the week, you live worldly. Jesus said, you're either in or you're out. You're either for me or you're against me. I know that's hard preaching this morning, but it's truth. God said, 
You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm not God, but I know what God said. I know what his word said. And this is we have to get right or get left. One way or the other. Get right or get left. And so Elijah said, I want you to call down fire from heaven. And them folks got out there, y'all, and they screamed. The Bible said from morning until noon, they shouted. They had the bull set up out there. They danced around. Boy, they did get their little tribal dance. And, and oh, they, they cut themselves with rocks, and, and the blood was flowing. And Elijah, he's standing over on the sidelines. And I'm sure people think, well, he's being a good sport. Not exactly. Elijah said, what's wrong? He'd give them all the way to evening time. What's wrong? Does he God not hear? Is he taking a journey? Is he going to the bathroom? Is he on vacation? Does he need a hearing aid? Surely he's a God. Surely he can sit down fire. And finally they give up. And they said, all right, Elijah, it's your turn. They put the bull out there. For Elijah to call down fire from heaven. And Elijah, Brother Randall, he said, you know what? I'm going to make it a little more difficult. He said, get four large jugs of water. And he said, I want you to pour it out over that wet. I want you to pour it out on that wood. I want you to pour it out over that bull. I want you to dig them trenches and fill them trenches up with water. Fill them four large pots up with water. Amen. Last week we learned how Elisha and, and the woman, the, the widow woman there, how they it kept flowing. Amen. God kept putting the oil in her little in her little pot there that she had. Listen, that four large pots of water, they soaked everything down. Elijah said, do it again. They did it again. And he said, do it again a third time. They did it again a third time. And he got out there. And you can take your Bible in 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse number 29. You can see that right then and right there, Elijah stopped. And he began to pray. He began to talk to God. He said, oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, hear me, God. He said, God, send down fire and let these people know that I'm standing in front of today. Let them know that I've done it by your command. Let them know that you are God. And he began to cry out to the Lord. And all he did was pray and talk to God. And about that time, the Bible said there was something orange that began to fall from heaven. There was something as a meteor that come down from heaven and it landed on that bull. It burnt that bull up. All that wet wood that was out there, it licked up that wet wood and burned it. All of them trenches of water, the sand, the soil, everything was burnt up. All because one man of God talked to the real God and said, Lord, Show them. Show them who is God. Let them know that Baal is not God. Let them know that, that uh, Ahab and Jezebel are not gods. Let them know that Jehovah is the one true God and is the only God of not only Israel, but all of the world. Lord, let fire fall down rain like rain from heaven, and it did. And that's not the only people that experienced the fire. But I want you to see here, there's two more people in the New Testament, Brother Bruce. The two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, do you remember them? The Bible said that they were just walking down the road. This is after Jesus was crucified. And the Bible said they were just walking down the road, minding their own business. Matter of fact, they were arguing with each other. Huh. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't act all holier now. Y'all know you argue with your spouse all the time. You argued on the way to church this morning, didn't you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Most time the devil tries to get you arguing. We didn't argue this morning. We drove separate vehicles. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But these two men were walking down the road to Emmaus. They were going home. They had watched Jesus die. They thought he was the Messiah, so they're arguing. Man, did you see that? Well, I see it this way. Well, I didn't. I see it this way. And, and all of a sudden, they have an encounter with the risen Christ. They don't know who he is, though. They're too busy arguing with each other. And Jesus shows up right beside them, and they're sitting here arguing. And Jesus said, well, what's all this about? And they said, 
Are you a stranger in the land? Have you not known our Messiah had come and they killed him? And he's dead. And Jesus started opening up the scriptures to him. And he started back in Genesis. And then he went to the prophets. And then he even is found on the Psalms. And he goes to their house and breaks bread. And as soon as he blessed the bread, them two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, we know who he is. Touch Jesus. We remember who prays like that. There's only one person that prays like that. That's Jesus. And the Bible said they turned around and he's gone. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he expounded the scriptures to us? Did not our hearts burn? Was not a fire on the inside of us? And that wasn't all. Jeremiah the prophet. But before I tell you about Jeremiah, I want to ask you, do you see what the, what the fire represents? The fire represents the presence of Almighty God. It represents the presence of Almighty God. You see, the, that burning bush didn't make it holy. The burning bush didn't make the ground. He was standing on holy ground. What made it holy ground was the presence of God inside of that burning bush. Mm. You know, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Moses didn't lead the children of Israel. God did with his presence. You see, Elijah didn't defeat the 850 prophets by himself, but God did defeated them. The two guys on the road to Emmaus, that wasn't just an emotional experience that they had. The presence of God showed up and that was real. That what was burning on the inside was not an emotion, it was real. And I want to tell you something, they're not the only ones that experienced it. Jeremiah in the Old Testament, he said there's a fire that shut up in my bones and I've got to speak the word of God. I can't be quiet. And did you know that he preached for years and years and years and didn't have one convert, not one. But yet he continued to preach. He never gave up. Jeremiah was a mighty prophet of God, but yet he never had nobody come and get saved. That's why the Bible called him the weeping prophet. He cried, he mourned because Israel had turned their backs so far away from God and they did not trust God anymore that it caused him to weep and cry. But Jeremiah said, there's a fire inside of here that I cannot put out. I've got to speak the word of God. I, I don't care nobody is coming to get and saved, but I've got to say it because God is putting it in here. And so Jeremiah, he experienced it. And then we go on later on to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And the Bible said that, that, that the tongues of fire come down as a fire come down and rested on all the people that were in the house. Church, I got to tell you, there's been so many people that has experienced the presence of God. And it's not nothing that's new. There used to be a song, that's what it was called, It Ain't New. It's been around since Pentecost 2,000 years ago when the Holy Ghost come down and filled those hungry souls. Millions are discovering what the power of God can do, but it ain't new. It ain't new. Church has been around as long as God's been around. It's nothing new, but the fire has always been. And the fire always will be. But what God is posing us the question this morning is will we keep the fire burning for Him? One, what is the fire? One, what is the fire? Well, we've learned it is the presence of Almighty God. Number two, whose responsibility, this is the second question, whose responsibility is it to keep the fire going? Amen. If we read Leviticus, Leviticus, down in verse number 12, and it says, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning, and it should never go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it and he shall burn their own the fat of the peace offering so a lot of people read that and say well it's the priest's job it's the pastor's job to keep the fire burning 
It's the deacon's job to keep the fire burning. It's the Sunday school teacher's job to keep the fire burning. It's the church staff's job to keep the fire burning. But as New Testament saints, we got to remember what Paul said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. He said, but you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a priest of God. I'm a priest of God. We are all priests of God. You are chosen. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. So it's not only the pastor's job, the deacon's job, the Sunday school teacher's job, the worship leader's job. It is all of our job to keep the fire burning. I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to hush you in just a moment. But I've had people say, Man, our, our church just got so cold. I've never heard it said here yet. I hope nobody comes up and says that. But they say, man, our church is so cold, I just can't feel nothing anymore. I've heard that. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Our church is so cold, I just can't feel nothing more. Well, listen, your church don't have to stay cold. If your church is cold, then you need to go in and set that baby on fire. Hallelujah. And you take the fire in. It's your responsibility as much as it is the pastor's responsibility. You go in and warm that baby up. Start out warming up one Christian and then they'll warm up another Christian. And before long get a spread like wildfire. Church, it only takes one spark to get a fire going. Only one spark to get a fire going. I've heard out in California them wildfires, people will be going down the road, Sister Sandra, and they toss a cigarette out the window and it would hit the ground and it would spark and it would cause a fire that would burn up thousands of acres of land. One spark is all it takes. Listen, are you that spark? It's all of our jobs to carry the fire, to keep the fire burning. And your church, if it's feeling cold, it don't have to stay that way. You can put that baby, eat that baby up. Amen. We used to have people that come to church with us at our former church. And, and, and there was always uh, this couple of people that would always come. And this church is great at that, but I'm just using this as an example. But there was always this couple of people that would, that would always welcome folks. Every time they'd come in, man, they'd go up to them, they would hug them and love on them and, and welcome them. And, and the ones that would do that most of the time, they were the people who had so much trouble going on in their lives. They had things that wasn't good, that wasn't going on. It was down and out. One of them had cancer. One of them didn't have much hope. But yet every Sunday morning, she was there hugging up people, saying, welcome, we love you. Oh, I hope you have a good time in Jesus today. She was carrying the fire. One person was carrying the fire, preparing him to get ready for worship. And what people didn't know was that person had bad stuff that was going on in their lives, but yet here they were, carrying the fire. And so when you are welcoming, when you are showing the love to people, you are carrying the fire and giving the fire to somebody else. It's a good thing. We used to have one known as the bubblegum man. Brother Rick, I think you're known as the peppermint man here. But we had one that was the bubblegum man. He passed out bubblegum to the kids. And Brother Rick, he passed out peppermint to children. Listen, that shows our young people that God loves them. Because here's a brother in the house of God that's showing them love. So that lets them know they have a father in heaven that loves them. And he's carrying the fire to our youth. Church, we need people of all ages to carry the fire and keep the fire going. I'm going to tell you this one more story and I'm going to hush in a minute. <laughs> when the Lord tells me to hush, I'll hush. Y'all should be ashamed of yourselves. Amen, I'm playing. I'm going to tell you this one more story. There was this man, he was going on vacation and he wasn't going to be able to, he was on a business trip is what it was. He was going to be gone for uh, several weeks and so when he gets to the place where he's staying, he goes and he asks the people at the condo, at the hotel, wherever he was at. He said, I want to know whether there's a good church at around here. I'm, I'm going to be away from my church, so I want to go to church while I'm here. And, and so he, he goes, he finds out where church is at. He goes Sunday morning, walks in the door. He sees people all in the foyer. Nobody says hello. Nobody welcomes him. 
So he goes on in and sits down, finds him a seat. The worship team's already up. They're playing a call to worship, getting people to come in. Nobody comes by and says nothing to him, welcome. Nobody pats him on the back. They just overlook him and go on by. And then they go on, the preacher comes through and they do all this and they're talking and they, you know, just nobody shows him any kind of welcome. And so at the end of the service, the preacher stands up and gives an altar call and not one soul come up. And they close the door. He was walking out and he walked right past the preacher. Never said one word to him. Right past everybody else. Nobody said one word to him. And so he forgot something some things on his trip and, and he remembered I need to go to Walmart and so he get, takes off he leaves the church he goes to Walmart when he walks into Walmart the very first thing they say is welcome to Walmart if I can help you with anything please let me know what I can do to help you to make your service a little more comfortable and he goes and he gets back to find what he's looking for and another uh, salesperson comes along and said are you finding everything okay if I can do anything to help you let me know and I'm good I just needed to get some eye drops and he got eye drops and he gets up to the counter and the counter lady said did you find everything you needed with a smile on her face and, and then he gets out to the door and we'll leave and they said we thank you for coming to Walmart come back again and, and shop with us he said thank you I will and as this man was walking out to his car he said you know the church give an invitation to join and nobody come he said but if Walmart would have given an invitation he said I would have joined them Walmart has a reason to be friendly. They want to get your business. They want to make your money. Do we not have something far more important than Walmart has? Do we not have something far more greater than Walmart has? Listen, they just want your money. But we as the church, we need to show the fire. Give them the fire. Give them the love and the grace and the mercy. Give them the welcome. And point them to Christ. It's a shame that Walmart's out doing the house of God. Now I'm saying I'm not getting on this church because everybody here does an awesome job at that. And I thank God for every one of you. But this is the truth. In a lot of places today, people don't, they don't pay no attention. Now unless some rich millionaire walks in the door, then they'll take them right up front, set them down where everybody can see them. But God said that's a shame. That's a shame. And it goes on right here. Whose responsibility is it? We look at this and we say, well, it's the priest, it's the pastors. But in fact, it's all of our responsibility. We are all priests of God. Hallelujah. Whose responsibility is it? It's every Christian's responsibility. Amen. Number three, here it is. How do we keep the fire burning? How do we keep the fire burning? burning. Amen. My wife and myself, we got married, Brother Bruce, back in March of 2006. I remember that. I noticed that it's like the number. 27. I said, before you did. But some people may think that we're still newlyweds. In my head, I'm thinking, well, it's been a long time. I play it. I better watch what she said. But you know, the truth is we're living in an age and culture today where there's more divorce than they are marriages. People think today when, whenever they can't, they get into an argument, they can't fix something, they think to throw it away and get, get something new. That's the, the, the knowledge of our young people today. And, and they're not being told any different uh, when you, instead of fixing something or working on something, just throw it away and get a new one. And that is what our people are thinking today. Listen, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not uh, saying sometimes you don't have to get a divorce. I'm not for divorce. By no means, don't think I am. But what I'm saying is this: instead of trying to get a divorce every time you have an argument, why don't you try to stop and pray together and work it out? Uh, there's God sounding that alarm again. See, here's your sign. Hey, Amen. We had that last week. Praise the Lord. But instead of throwing something away, why don't you stop and try to work it out and fix it? Listen, we have to keep the fire burning inside of our marriage. If me and her don't talk to one another, if we don't communicate with one another, 
There's nothing there. I listen. When I come home, if I just go and flop down and don't ever say nothing to my wife, or when she comes home, she just flops down and never says nothing to me, before long, we're going to get tired of that. And we're going to say, well, you know what? We're, one of us is trying, the other one ain't. And listen, what I'm trying to get at is this. How do you think our Lord feels when we say a three-second prayer in the morning and then forget to converse with Him throughout the day? How do you think our Lord feels whenever... We just don't talk to him at all. Mm. How do we keep the fire burning? Number one, we pray. Number one, we talk to God throughout our day. Listen, when we're talking, when we're praying to God, prayer, it's our communication with him. Listen, we have communication. Sometimes people would think that we probably fix to get a divorce, but that's just the way we communicate. We've had people say, y'all argue all the time. We say, we're not arguing. That's just the way we talk to each other. <laughs> Amen. Telling on y'all's pastor now. <laughs> Amen. Even in love, we, we like to joke and, and kid. But if we didn't have communication, I'm sure we probably wouldn't still be a couple today. God, he longs to hear from his children. That's our communication with God. How do we keep the fire burning? Well, we pray. We talk to God throughout the day. Listen, when we're talking to God throughout the day, we're growing closer to him. We are growing closer to him. And so number one, we pray, we talk, we have communication with God. Number two, what do we do? Well, if prayer is our communication to God, then number two, we hear his word. His word is His communication with us. Now, I know that when we pray, primarily prayer is us talking to God. Now, I know He can speak to you through prayer. I understand that. But if you really want to hear God's voice, get in His word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. We got to hear the word of God. That's His communication back to us and you know I can talk to her all day long but she don't ever talk back I'm going to get tired of talking for long and you know what it's not going to do us a bit of good God wants to speak to you as much as you want to speak to God He wants to give you what His Word says He wants to, to fill you up so number one prayer, number two hearing His Word, number three how do we get to keep the fire burning? It's by doing Christian service Doing Christian service. And, and there's so much I can say here. There's so many things. There's a lot of people in here today. And everybody in here, you have something that God wants for you to do. And it don't have to be the same thing as what somebody else is doing. God can give you something to do that nobody else in this church is doing. Let me put it to you like this. I heard a story about this young uh, this young man and the pastor, he, he would share the story with this young man. The boy started out and he was faithful to church. Every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, he was there every time the doors was open. If there was a revival, he was there every night of the week. I mean, this boy would not miss church for nothing. But then he started where he would miss a night or two here or there. And he'd miss a day here or there. And then he would miss another day. And before long, he began to miss a lot, and then a lot, and then a lot. Before long, he was hardly ever in church whatsoever. And so finally, one day, he comes up to that pastor, and he said, Pastor, I, I don't know what happened. I've lost my fire for God. I've lost my zeal for God. He said, I need to talk to you, Pastor. And the pastor said, listen, son, I've got a very urgent meeting right now at this point. I've got to get to it. He said, but I've got to, I want to ask you a favor. He said, there's an elder gentleman that hadn't been coming to our church in, in the past couple of Sundays. He said, would you mind please going down there and checking on this, this man? And the young man said, well, sure, sure, I'll do that. And he said, and then come back here and I should be done with the meeting and we'll sit down and we'll talk. And so this young man leaves and goes down the road to where he's supposed to go. And he gets to this elder gentleman's house. And, and as soon as he walks through the door, he finds out that this man is blind. And he walks in and he says, sir, the pastor wanted me to come and check on you. He said you hadn't been to church in a few Saturdays, a few Sundays. And I just want to check on you, make sure you was all right. And the, the older man said, I'm, thank you for coming, son. Thank you for coming. And, and tell the pastor I'm good. I just, I just weep right now. And... and, and 
the little boy said, well, sir, is there anything I can do for you while I'm here? Do you need any help with anything? And he says, son, if you don't mind, would you take that Bible over there and read it to me? So the young boy got up to the Bible, and when he opened the Bible up, the marker was on Romans chapter 8. And he began to read. He said, son, that's right where the last person ended reading that. Would you please read that to me? And so the young boy started reading, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for, as we all but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And then he went down, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. The young boy read that and he had tears coming out of his eyes. And he looked up and the elder gentleman, the blind gentleman had tears pouring out of his eyes. And he ran over to him, Brother Bruce, and he hugged him up. And he said, thank you. Thank you, son, for reading that. He said, no, thank you, sir. And as he was going out the door, the elder gentleman said, come back and see me sometime soon. He said, I think I will. The young boy run back to the church and he seen the pastor. He said, Pastor, we don't have to have that meeting now. He said, I've got the fire of God back in my life. He said, I finally understand what it's all about. I found out what God wanted me to do. Listen, church, sometimes we just got to do something for the Lord. We pray. We, we get in the Bible study. We, we study our Bibles. Listen, when you're at home, we should be studying our Word. And when we walk away from our, our studying of our word, we should have a burden inside of our heart because we just spent time with God. And if you say you don't have time to, to do it, it's not a time problem, it's a love problem. Mm. Because we make time for the things that we love. Mm. So we keep the fire burning by praying by studying our Bible by doing Christian service by doing things that God wants us to do amen let me get to the last point right here I can see people already looking stomachs already growling praise the Lord let me get to the last point finally why do we keep the fire burning why do we keep the fire burning? That's the last question. And I'm going to tell you, tell you this like this. There's several reasons why we keep the fire burning, but the main one is because God said so. Listen, when I was at home, I still lived at home with my mom and dad. I knew if I pulled my chair up to daddy's dinner table, well, I better do what he said I better do. Now, he didn't stay at home all the time, but I knew if I disobeyed my daddy, I was going to get my end tore up. Can I say that in church? I knew that I was, he wasn't going to spare the rod. Daddy wasn't about to spoil no child. He was going to beat you with that rod and save you from hell. Amen. We was reading that last night. I said, hey, we need to show that to our kids. It said, you beat them with a rod, you're saving them from hell. So that's what we're going to start doing. Boy, get me. I'm saving you from hell right now. But Daddy, why? You ain't going to hell, boy. Amen. Listen to what we say. Oh, man. I'm not going to beat my kids. Hey, man, if somebody calls child services, they see this video, they're going to call child services. Hey, man, we do whip our kids, though. I will say that. But I believe it's in the Bible. Train up your child. Discipline your child. Tell you what, if you do it at home now, you'll save them a trip to jail or the grave later. Amen. But because God said so, and we need to do what God asks us to do. You know, my daddy, he was just a man, but my God, 
He's my heavenly Father. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is my everything, my Savior, and we need to do what God asks us to do. And sometimes, church, it's difficult to keep the fire burning. I, I understand that sometimes it's hard. Can you imagine just for a moment about these priests when they were walking through the desert carrying that flame with them? I know it would be hard for them as they're carrying the flame. And they probably said sometimes, Sister Sandra, before they probably said, let's just blow out this flame and we'll keep a couple coals and we can always get it started back up. But they didn't do it. They obeyed God because God said, don't let the fire go out. Jewish scholars teaches us that Israel did not let the fire go out for over a thousand years. They kept the fire burning for over 1,000 years because they obeyed God. And it was up until the Babylonians come and took Israel over that they ever let the fire go out. And here we are today in church and we're looking for ways to let it go. This flame's too hard to carry. No, it's not hard to carry. It's not hard to carry at all. You see, Christ has done gone before you prepared the way. He said, I've done gone make crooked places straight. Oh, the high places low. I've come and already gone before you. All you got to do is run and run this race with patience. And keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. Second reason is because this. there's still people that's living in darkness that's out there looking for light. There's still people out there. Remember when we started this sermon, this message, we talked about how this world was full of darkness and how darkness covered the land. There's still people out there that's looking for light. Still people. And we're called to be the light bearers. And we need to take the fire of God, the presence of God to people and His love and His mercy. And then the third reason we need to keep the fire burning for those behind us. How many in here has children? You have children. You have grandchildren. How many's got great grandchildren? Anybody got great grand got great grandchildren? Great grandchildren? Think about this. For all the ones that's coming up behind us, may the life that we live inspire them to obey God. May the ones that's coming up behind us find us faithful in the life that we live. Listen, we need to keep that fire burning not only for our love, for our loved ones around us now, but for the ones that's coming behind us. May they dig up in the future. Amen. When they're looking up old pictures and, and they start talking about pictures once we've been going to heaven for 20 years, 30 years, may they say that your grandma, your grandpa, your mom and daddy, they love the Lord. They left behind a legacy. They left behind Oh, hallelujah, their Christian testimony. Listen, because when we die, that's all we're going to be able to leave. It's how we lived our life. Did it impact? Did it make an impact on those around us? Amen. We can't carry nothing with us when we go. Keep the fire burning for those behind us. May the fire of our devotion lead them to believe. Amen. I pray this morning that everyone in here, that we would pray the prayer. Would you stand all over the house? Amen. I know we still got communion to do. Hallelujah. But our prayer this morning, I pray every one of us would drop to our knees and just say, Lord, light a fire inside of me that no man can put out. Lord, light a fire inside of our hearts. You know, we could go on and talk about Matthew 25, but God said, stop right here. We got to keep our lamps trimmed and full of oil. Keep them burning. We got to keep the fire burning and don't let it go out. The enemy's out to blow out your candle. He's out to blow out your fire. And he wants you to hide it. But church, we're living in a day. Right now, we don't need to hide anything. We need to let Jesus come forth. Amen. With all that is within us. Listen, the devil is roaming every street, every schoolhouse. You say, why is there school shootings? Because we've kicked God out and let the enemy in. Why is there so much evil? Because we've told God we don't want Him over our nation anymore. We've let the fire go out at Washington, D.C. We've let the fire go out in our schoolhouses and we are letting the darkness come in. 
And where there is no light, the darkness prevails. I'm telling you, men and women of God, we need some folks that will say, God, strike a fire in me that when I go out into this lost world that I let off a light, amen, that all the world can see. And like we said earlier, we need men, women, and children to all go out. Senior adults, I'm not going to say old people, but senior adults, we need you for your, but I'm not pointing at you, Brother Bill. <laughs> we need you for your wisdom. You know things. You know how life works. And we need you. Young people for their energy and their enthusiasm. I'm telling you, they can run around and get a lot more compass than we can. And then for the ones that's in the middle, neither young nor old. Huh? We need you to go out and be a light in this world. You understand the realness of this world. You're living in it every day. So I pray everybody in this room would make up their mind today to be a light in this dark world that we're living in. Let nothing but Jesus shine through you. Amen, Father. In the name of Jesus, we give your word this morning. I pray, God, that everybody here today would make up their mind to let their fire stay burning inside of them and not let the enemy put it out. God, if we are nothing but a flickering flame, I pray, God, that you would light us on fire. Let us be an inferno for you. Let us be a light to this lost world and to those behind us. Lord God, I pray that we give people Jesus and, and give them the fire of God. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing here, God, and what you're going to do, Father. And we just uh, thank you for your word this morning, God. And we give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. Now, God, I thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If there's anybody here this morning, you need to... Uh, to pray, you need to talk to the Lord and